We've talked uh, nothing but a lot of good with Michigan football here in 2021 with uh, Justin Rowe from Blue by 90 podcast. This is a bit of an aberration and unfortunately right at the end of the season, but that's the deal with just about everybody around college football is it doesn't end well. And uh, for Michigan, a disappointing finish at the uh, college football playoff at the Orange Bowl against Georgia. And we'll get into it, Justin, because I'm sure you have not thought about it, talked about it enough yet. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's uh, it's one of those things where I think that, uh, you know, a lot of Michigan fans and myself included, right, leading up to that game, you're so hyped, you're, uh, you know, for a lot of Michigan fans out there, I think this was me, and I can speak for them, it was trying to convince yourself that Michigan could beat Georgia, right, and you're trying to say, all right, here's how we could do it, this game plan, this game plan, you know, they, you know, they their offense isn't really that good, blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, it just ended up that they were bigger, faster, stronger, and that was really all they needed to do. Um, and so, you know, with that being said, I wasn't, I still look at it as a super, super positive outlook for Michigan season. I think anybody saying anything different is ridiculous, to be honest. Um, best, probably the best Michigan season this decade, um, you know, 2004 maybe could have been it with a Rose Bowl victory. Uh, 2003 into 2004 um, but other than that I mean there's there aren't many good seasons like this where you beat Ohio State and win a Big Ten title there you go uh, beat Ohio State win a Big Ten championship that hasn't been done since 2011 2004 added up it's not difficult to come out with a positive result in that the Georgia situation so you know I was attempting to, of course, evaluate, analyze, and then, okay, come up with my prediction, which ended up being Michigan 27-24, even though I, wow. I basically, I, yes, although if you listen to my prediction video, it was almost as if everything I stated up to the conclusion was, Mark, you just told us all the reasons why Georgia's going to win this game, <laughs> and then you're going to be because I, I said if these two teams met 100 times, Georgia wins about 70 times and I check off a ton of boxes on Georgia's side and very few on Michigan's. I went through the whole thing and that I, I even threw out like a crazy, like if somebody would tell me today, this is going to be 45, 14, I'd say, well, Georgia won, uh, that, that there was all this on Georgia's side, but still, I, I didn't think there was as much difference between the two teams, number one. And number two, the better team doesn't always win. And I just thought it was Michigan was playing together and steamrolling and momentum and and everything and in Georgia who knows where they were going into kickoff psychologically so we got our answer okay we and did. I even went to the point Justin that I was on Michigan podcast the other day and I thought okay uh, I want to reacquaint myself with what I saw four or five days ago um, and so I, I watched the first half because I was trying to gauge okay I'm going to look at every play and after the play, kind of determine, was that a talent thing or was that a scheme thing? And most of them, I thought, were, were talent issues. You know, speed, size, athleticism. There were some times where, you know, Cade McNamara threw it a little wide and Eric All could have possibly caught it. That would have converted a third down. Obviously, Georgia had nothing to do with that play except for being in the vicinity that's a quarterback and a tight end misconnecting, not connecting on a third. And, uh, you know, then who knows what happens in the rest of the drive. So you have those unforced errors. But, you know, where was your assessment in regards to coaching and scheme versus talent versus maybe it was just a bad night? I, I think it was a, it ended up being a little bit of all of that, you know, but I think first and foremost, it was talent. It, it was just that it was Georgia being super fast and super strong. And the one time the when I when I realized that was when Blake Corum tried to get to the edge and their linebacker beat him there. I don't think Blake Corum got beat to the edge one time before that all season. I mean, he's one of the fastest backs in the country. And it and it's just a different type of speed when you have a, a linebacker that's able to match up with a Blake Corum like that. And so when Michigan wasn't able to get to the edge Obviously, they weren't getting the run game going up the middle either. Then all of a sudden, it was like, all right, I don't know what they do. So for me, I don't think Josh Gaddis uh, called a great game or had a great game plan. But I also think 
a lot of it could have worked it, but Georgia just blew it all up, you know, and it wasn't just that they had a better scheme. It was just, you know, even on the, on the play that you're talking about with Cade McNamara to Eric Hall, I think Cade McNamara was off a step every single play because he hadn't gotten that kind of pressure on him all year. Right. So when, when you're having those, that big of guys come up the middle and get pressure on both offense, defense, everywhere, really, you know, then the game plan, it might look great on paper. It might be great, but if you have better guys playing against you, then it's probably not going to work. Yeah. And then I tried to add up the whole big 10 sec narrative and there were other games played between the conferences. And what does that mean? And I, have somewhat come to the conclusion, and I think that's complex. I think we can go all different routes because, as we talked about with with talent, if you believe in the 247 sports team rankings, then Michigan showed up with the 15th most talented team in the country, and Georgia showed up with the second most talented team in the country. But Ohio State's got the third most talented team in the country, and obviously Michigan won that game convincingly. And there are different matchups involved and so forth. But I, I kind of come to the conclusion that the Big Ten is a strong conference. It's the second best conference in the nation. I think the SEC is stronger, but I, I think those two teams that we're going to see on Monday night are just, they've separated themselves. And I think maybe Ohio State in some ways is, they are technically as talented, but I don't think there's any question after watching the games that this Ohio State edition wouldn't match up quite. It would, it would be an interesting matchup to see. Of course, we'd like to see a lot of different matchups out there that we won't. But yeah, I, I just I think Michigan would play a better game maybe if they saw them round two and be like, okay, the shock's worn yeah. off. Yeah. We can see them again. We can get used to this speed because speed, speed, and you you there are ways to camouflage it and and make up for it, especially when you've got NFL type speed yourself. Shoot, Northwestern does it against better teams in the Big Ten, faster and more talented teams all the time and get away with it. So there, there are ways to do it. And But, you know, I'm, I'm watching this game again and even the replay scratching my head because I'm thinking Georgia's going to produce more NFL players off this roster, but not that many. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, when we're talking about even going back to that whole Big Ten versus SEC thing too, I, I tried to say it like this on our last podcast where do I think that Michigan is on Alabama or Georgia's level? No, I don't think they're close quite yet. They don't have the recruiting. They don't have the talent. Do I think that Michigan could match up and be competitive or beat the rest of the SEC? Yes, I absolutely do think that. So I think it's not a Big Ten versus SEC. I think it's the top two teams of each conference right now are so far in a, ahead of, of the rest of them in the SEC specifically is really to that point, you know. Um, so that's what I that's where I'm at in terms of Big Ten versus SEC. And then in terms of Michigan, you know, talent, speed, NFL, all that stuff. I, I think they're I mean, you want to say, oh, act like you've been there before. They've never been there before. Michigan's never been there before. There definitely is a shock factor there. There's a there's a lights go on, all of a sudden you've been playing. Big 10 teams, you know, even Ohio State, let's think about their, you know, this offensive line for Michigan was phenomenal all year. They didn't play, a, I mean, Wisconsin's defensive line was pretty solid. Penn State's was pretty solid. Honestly, Ohio State's defensive line was one of the worst that they've had in quite some time. So when you go from that to this Georgia defensive line, that is unbelievable. You know, this is one of the best – I, I kept trying to, to you know, talk to people and say, you have to go look at the stats that Georgia put up on defense this year and not just look at the Alabama game. Because if you look at the Alabama game, it's so much different than every other game on their schedule. My God, they're, the games they played against the rest of the schedule was just unbelievable. Nobody could move the ball even a little bit on them. So I, I think it just does still come back down to that talent. And then, you know, for Michigan, that shock factor where, you know, when Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajabo can't get to the quarterback every time, well, now the secondary is doing stuff that they haven't done all year. You know, when Michigan can't run the ball and their offensive line is not getting a push, 
all of a sudden you're Josh Gaddison. You're saying, well, shit, that was our entire game plan. Now what do we do? You know? So I, I think it's shock factor all around for nobody likes it when things don't go well. And, and I don't think Michigan, uh, honestly, I don't think that they did a great job all year of having a plan B. You know, even Mike McDonald in this game, I was so frustrated at, once again, them, Michigan being late onto the field in terms of substitutions. When when Georgia would, would rotate or do a, a motion, Michigan couldn't figure it out. You know, we saw that in Michigan's only loss prior to this game against Michigan State. And that was a huge issue in that game. I was a little disappointed in both coaches, Josh Gaddis and Mike McDonald. You know, so I think game scheme, you know, did have a factor. But ultimately, like you said, I think it's going to be, you know, well, I'd love I'd love to go. We could go down the roster at some point here and take a look who's going to the NFL for Michigan versus Georgia, too. And then there are people that look back on the game and they go first to the quarterback position. And in defense of Kate McNamara, just what you stated, he hadn't seen any kind of pressure like that this year. And it doesn't matter what quarterback you are, pressure affects you. Even the best are affected by pressure. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, there's been a lot of talk out there. And I'm sure you've heard more of it than I have. Okay, you need a stud, a quarterback to win a national championship. J.J. McCarthy's that guy, not yeah. Kate McNamara. So automatically, J.J. should be the guy next year. Uh, I, I, So there are so many people out there that are saying exactly that. It's no, like, Cade's transferring. J.J.'s going to be the guy no matter what. I say hold your horses. You know, there are, yes, J.J.'s talent is definitely above Cade McNamara. There's no doubt. He can move with his legs. He's got a cannon for an arm. But he also makes some errant throws. He is not this polished up guy that is going to make every throw perfect. So, you know, who does do that right now? Cade McNamara does essentially make every throw well. You know, maybe it's not – he's not going to make a miraculous throw, but when he decides to make a throw – most of the time, it's going to be on target and more more importantly, not making a bad decision and throwing into coverage, right? And my thing that I keep going back to is Jim Harbaugh loves the guy that doesn't make mistakes and doesn't throw interceptions. And guess who's calling the shot of who plays quarterback? It's Jim Harbaugh, you know? And so I think that it's not a done deal right this second. J.J. very well may be the starting quarterback come September 3rd next year. But I think there's a lot of things that he needs to do over this offseason to grow up. He's seen the, the playing time all year a little bit. But to overtake that spot, he's going to have to grow up a little bit, make better decisions, learn how to slide, not get absolutely smacked by a Georgia linebacker every time, You know, throw the ball away. He's going to have to be able to do those things that Cade McNamara does right now. And if he can do that type of stuff plus be this athletic phenom phenom, then yes, absolutely. He'll be the starting quarterback. And to Jim Harbaugh's uh, defense, he's not the only coach that's like that. Most coaches, almost a hundred percent, they're, they're risk averse. Uh, and, and especially when you're at Michigan and you figure, well, we can beat the other team at all the other positions. We right. need the quarterback. Sure. We need him to make plays. He can't just be handing the ball off and throwing dump offs, but I'll take that, that downgrade of those three or four wow throws a game for the guy that's not going to make the mistakes because we're better. Yeah. And, and I else. think too, you, you think about, it's college athletics, right? It's college football. These kids are 20 years old. You know, this is not a, a 31 year old NFL vet that's making these decisions. You know, it, it's really you, if you eliminate mistakes in college football, you win football games. There's a very, very easy translation to that. You know, I, the, you probably know it, you know, you're the stats guy of everything, you know, the plus minus out there of winning football games is like the it's tra the trajectory is line. It's, it's right there, you know. So it, it's it's something where you do have to factor that in, because when you do throw J.J. in at some point, if you do, 
he's going to have some mistakes because he's going to try and make some miraculous play where he spins out of this out of the pocket, goes and makes some sidearm throw like Patrick Mahomes, and then you're going to be like, oh shit, he threw that one, he threw a pick. Cade McNamara is not going to do that because he just took the sack or threw it away in the beginning, you know. So what do you what do you want, and what do you what's the best case scenario is really the bigger question. I guess the other question for a lot of people out there would be, is Jim Harbaugh going to be making those decisions? Or is he going to be making a decision about uh, should Derek Carr throw it 30 times or 35 times a game or whatever? Uh, so so how valid do you think the discussion is about Jim Harbaugh moving out of the NFL? So, so Jim Harbaugh underachieving is an NFL discussion yeah. and Jim Harbaugh overachieving is an NFL discussion. So it's always just going to be there. It's always going to be there. I mean, you know it. You've you've done the ESPN thing. It gets you clicks. Is, is, is Jim Harbaugh the most clickable name in sports? Because he's definitely up there. Uh, and Bruce Feldman is using it to his, uh, his advantage right now. I'll tell you that. Um, but, I, you know, I – yeah, we're, we're to the yearly uh, Jim Harbaugh to the NFL conversation. It happens every December or January. This year it was postponed a month because they went to the playoff. Um, but I, I think that this could be more likely than in past years, and I'll tell you why. The, the reason is he did check off a couple boxes this year, right? So those are things. He's a competitive guy. Maybe, just maybe, he says, I did it. I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish here outside of a national title. You know, let me go out on top where now Michigan fans still can love me. You know, but maybe he thinks in the back of his head, can I really beat Ohio State again next year in Columbus or should I go out with a victory here? That stuff, maybe it's in the back of his head, you know, but I still think, you know, what, yes, I think it's more likely than in previous years, but I still think he's more likely to stay. I, I think that he's it, it's it's going to lean uh, to Jim Harbaugh staying. The rumors about him right now uh, is that he's leveraging this season, uh, not for money, but for Michigan's athletic department and boosters and whoever is the decision maker there to get a big NIL program going. Maybe t talk about the admissions and academic standards and lower that so that they can bring in transfer portal guys and they can get the credits instead of Michigan denying them. So I think he's thinking about it in a different way to say, hey, if you don't want me to walk and go to the NFL, we got to make some changes in order to make our program competitive with the Georgias and the Alabamas of the world. Otherwise, this is just always going to be an uphill battle. Michigan fans should just be happy that you just made that final statement and you left Ohio State out because, boom, beat Ohio State. So, hey, I mean, Michigan it's is competitive. As for right now, Michigan is competitive with Ohio State. Absolutely, they are. Absolutely. Um, so, I guess I'll have to pause here for a second because I had a definite line of thinking where I was headed and then I, I broke stride and completely well, forgot. I do, I do have some breaking news for you that happened just now. If we wanted to go the route of guys going to the NFL and transfer portal and stuff like that, Dax Hill did just declare to go to the NFL. So, uh, you know, five-star guy for Michigan safety, phenomenal athlete. Um, he is declared to go to the NFL. So that's a, that's a big blow for Michigan. Not unexpected even a little bit, though. I mean, he had got to uh, his junior year. Um, you know, he definitely looked NFL ready in terms of speed. That was the one guy, even he though, looked slow and off kilter sometimes versus Georgia that I thought he was the one guy that was going to be able to cover some of those guys, but even he struggled. Um, but yeah, he is off to the NFL. Yeah. I, I remember, um, yeah, a few times where he either looked a step slow or, he made a good play or what should have resulted in a good play, but it just kind of didn't matter. Like one in particular, and this happened like three or four times in different ways at different places on the field. But the one in particular that I remember is he, he, uh, he was blitzing off the edge. He, he jumped and was right in the quarterback's lane in Stetson Bennett's lane to, to throw the outlet. And he, he got a piece of the football, but 
So lo and behold, the ball still had enough on it to get to the back who made eight yards or 12 yards or whatever. It just turned out to be an unsuccessful play. And, you know, but th they were just like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I do think he, you know, if, if we go back to the talent conversation, I definitely think he's right there with there. He's right there with all those guys that we're talking about who are super talented on Georgia's team. Um, you know, I, I did want to make this comment too. I, I should have made it when we were talking about the, the Michigan versus Georgia game back then. But, you know, the other part of that game was Georgia hit on every big play. Every single time it was like, oh, they went deep or they had this perfect, uh, you know, it, the ball did roll their way. Um, and they made it that happen. Yeah. You know, it wasn't luck, but – they didn't miss on any of those deep balls, and Michigan missed on all, you know basically all of them. When they got a they, when they needed a turnover, when Michigan's in the red zone, they got a turnover. So that was part of, the, of what happened on on uh, New Year's Eve as well. And, and in the the balance perspective, there I think, in my opinion, is that yes, Georgia made the plays. They're extremely talented. Michigan maybe not quite as talented. Didn't make the plays, but if you watch any college offense. They're not, they're not hitting all those shots, regardless of how good or bad the coverage is. Even if somebody gets burned, they're missing a throw 40 yards downfield. Right. Uh, but yeah, they, they didn't miss. They just didn't miss. They did not. They did not. And, and yeah, I think, like you said, I think it's, you know, part of it was those guys got burnt, you know, but also there were times, I mean, Stetson freaking Bennett, who's a former walk-on, is just dropping a 50 yard dime, you know, I, yes, he has played pretty well all year. Um, but I don't think he's been making those types of throws on a regular basis, you know, to guys. So it, it just, it didn't seem like anything was going to work for Michigan and everything was going to work for Georgia. What, what, uh, and, and I might be imagining this, but again, I rewatched the first half just two days ago and this seemed to be fairly common too. Georgia would get like seven yards on first down and be second and three. Then Michigan would stone them on second down and be like third and two. And then Georgia would barely get a first down. Yep. They would get yep. like two and a half yards and barely move the sticks. It happened. It felt like every possession it, it happened. And the, the most frustrating thing was just first down. It was an easy eight, nine yards, like every time in, from I was sitting, I was there. I was sitting uh, at right at the fifty yard line, and um, it was like, oh my god, how many times can they run it up the middle on first down and get those eight yards? You know, it was like it was just one of those things that it, it felt like we couldn't stop that uh, at all. And then you know the when you're running third and two, like you know your your conversion rate there is going to be pretty high, right? But I, I totally agree. It, it felt like just like – and it was early because at the end, you know, after a couple of scores, it didn't matter. But even early on, it was like a couple of things go a couple of different ways. Do I think Michigan wins? No, but it wasn't – it wouldn't have been like – it was just a couple backbreakers that it was like, oh, we got them. Oh, no, we don't. And then it, it, things unravel pretty quickly when you have a few of those. What was your thought process in the moment – Georgia had scored, was it Michigan's first possession? They went for it fourth and four at like midfield. I was like, oh, oh boy, we we're doing this. Um, I, I did not feel great about it. Um, you know, I, I liked that, you know, Jim's probably thinking we got to be aggressive and take chances to win this game, right? You can't just play conservative. But also, it was not like they were on the 40, you know, the, the other 40-yard line. It was like, I think they were on their own 45, I believe, or something to that effect. So, I, I didn't like that. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think you can go back in hindsight and look at a lot of things, you know. Sure. But, um, you know, I, I think that Jim Harbaugh is probably thinking, we got to take advantage of everything and get momentum and that type of stuff because – the last thing he wanted was to go down 14, nothing. Right. And, uh, you know, unfortunately that's how it went, but, um, yeah, I, I definitely, I liked it until it was one of those things where you like to call it until they don't get it. And it's like, Oh, you idiot. You know, 
Yeah, that's that's how it always is. But you know, if you got a quarterback who's completing sixty five percent of his passes, even against Georgia, I don't know what the numbers were. They were probably a little bit lower. Then you're most likely going to complete the pass for at least four yards, and that's the kind of percentage you're looking at. So you're you're right. Actually, you probably didn't get to see the first game, but uh, if if they would have punted, if they would have played that kind of game, kind of keep away, let's try to extend the game. It would have mirrored Alabama. Alabama beat Cincinnati and was a slow burn that you yeah. knew from drive number one, this game's over. But it's not going to look ugly, but it's over. Yeah. All right. So if we hit anything else, uh, the defensive line coach, uh, Sean Noah, who moves on to USC, is there any way to determine what's going to happen there? Did they go within or elsewhere? Um, well, first of all, I think that um, it's not that big of a blow to Michigan. I, you know, I think obviously Michigan's D line was one of the best in the country this year. Um, but I think that Sean knew if you asked us last year, we would have all said he needs to go, you know, and, and so a lot of, and that's just being honest. Most people wanted him gone. Jim Harbaugh kept it for, kept him for another year, probably saved Sean Nua's career. Um, and it definitely helped Michigan this year. He did develop guys in, like Mozzie uh, Smith and Chris Hinton, uh, who Chris Hinton just declared for the NFL draft as well. Um, he definitely developed those guys over the past year. Um, but he's also missed on some really big recruits that Michigan needed uh, in terms of interior D linemen. So I, I think it's a little bit of a blow, but I think he's replaceable. Um, I think Michigan should go out and get a dynamite recruiter I think they really need a, a, a big-time recruiter on the D-line in the middle there for that. Um, and so what I've heard is they're still looking outside, um, but Ryan Osborne, who was uh, an analyst for Michigan on the defensive line, um, has, has been the name that people are talking about of him uh, moving up and taking that spot. I think it's uh, I, I think it's going to be another one of those, like Jim Harbaugh's going young, taking a chance on a guy, that has proven himself to be good in terms of scheme, but more importantly, he meshes well with the guys and is pretty good on the recruiting trail. Um, so he was like one of the most likable guys, it seemed like, from the uh, from the players this year. And, it, and I think Jim is really, really taking a liking to guys that can can be in that uh, locker room and and work with his players. Got Justin Rowe on the line from Blue by 90 podcast. Uh, please check out his work right there. Joins us on a regular basis here at the Voice of College Football. Please like the video, share the videos out on social media, subscribe right here at the Voice of College Football as well. And uh, just to go back to your earlier point in not breaking the news, but reporting the breaking of the news of Daxton Hill. And I want to clarify something I said when I said he looked a slip, a step slow against Georgia. Not necessarily that. He didn't look like the impact player because he was playing more like athletes than him where he wasn't necessarily, again, making game-changing kind of plays. Uh, so Dax Hill moving out of the NFL. Um, the Chris Hinton decision, maybe not necessarily the best, as you had mentioned to me before we started to record. David Ajabo has made his decision. Unfortunately, his last game, he was minus the stat sheet against Georgia, just completely uh, a non-factor there. Anybody else we're looking at? Um, I mean, I think those are the guys that, that people were talking about. Dax Hill was one that uh, people didn't know if he maybe takes his extra year of eligibility or not. Um, but I think, I you know, the whole thing, the whole COVID year now is, I don't know who's got eligibility <laughs> when. It, it's <laughs> People are they they might have a seventh or eighth year at this point. I don't know. Um, and honestly, seventh there are year, couple, yeah. There are a couple guys, a um, yeah, couple guys on Michigan that I've talked to, a couple players that are saying, "Hey, yeah, I'm talking to Coach Harbaugh this week. Might come back for a super super senior year." Um, so it's kind of crazy right now. I don't know what's going to happen, but um, I never know when that people are like, "Oh, does he have another year? Can he come back?" I'm like. I have no idea. I just assume everybody's eligible forever and ever at this point. <laughs> Pretty much because now you can't even look them up online because the junior or sophomore or whatever the designation next to their name, it's like, okay, which way are they counting? So right. nobody knows. Right. Exactly. All right. Justin Rowe, Blue by 90 podcast. Uh, Justin, we appreciate you being here. 
Thank you. Thanks for having me.